You're telling me I flew all the way to Kentucky to get some of your fried chicken and, and the Colonel isn't even working today? Kentucky Fried Chicken, or KFC, has been around since 1952 and has become an American institution. From small towns to big cities, KFC now operates 20,000 restaurants globally. Not bad for a Colonel who never really was a Colonel. So let's get down to the herbs and spices and check out the top 10 untold truths of KFC. Now, be forewarned, when it comes to Kentucky Fried Chicken, one or two of these untold truths should have, in retrospect, maybe remained untold. I'm Colonel Sanders, and I'm back, America. KFC is an acronym for nothing. Be like a Kentucky Fried Idiot. You'd think that KFC simply stands for Kentucky Fried Chicken, and that's that, right? Well, you'd be wrong. A savvy marketing division decided to shorten it for two basic business reasons. To increase revenue and lower expenses. It may seem like a stupid detail, but feeling that the word fried in the company name was deterring health-conscious people, right as everyone was hopping on the health-conscious bandwagon, they decided it had to go. Moreover, in 1990, the state of Kentucky trademarked its name. Yeah, not an accident. This, in essence, now meant that Kentucky Fried Chicken would need to pay a licensing fee every time they used the name Kentucky in any company branding. With about 5,000 restaurants in operation by then, and with plans to open thousands more across the globe, that was going to be a few boatloads of money the company was not willing to pay. They also had already figured out that in this era of shortcuts, we were already calling them KFC anyways. So why not just make it official? Today, the name Kentucky Fried Chicken has been completely completely phased out of all company branding. Just look for the containers that say KFC on them. That's bird meat, dude. Before we get to the really unsavory stuff, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell to join our notification squad. So let the colonel be your whole family. KFC is chicken with a cause. Really, really nice. Good and they're doing the colonel proud. There's an abundance of easily accessible scientific data that directly links fried foods and obesity to certain cancers. A 2003 study released by the Journal of the National Cancer Institute showed that obesity was also the culprit directly linked to breast cancer, especially in postmenopausal women. So it would seem odd that a company whose near entire menu is deep fried would champion any cause for cancer awareness. Well, by April 2010, KFC's corporate strategy publicly announced an initiative called Buckets for the Cure, whose mission it was to raise the largest single donation in history towards the Komen organization, a foundation whose aim it is to end breast cancer. From April to the end of May 2010, the campaign would donate 50 cents from every single newly branded pink fried chicken bucket sold towards the cause. The family-sized buckets had cancer survivors and victims' names printed on them. Moreover, to promote the partnership, make no mistake, this was a mutually beneficial partnership for both KFC and Komen, the KFC website was made bright pink for the duration of the initiative and contained inspirational survivor stories and cancer facts and information. Although the campaign itself did more good than harm, many critics accused both companies of a pinkwashing campaign, a blatant act of self-serving commercialism claiming cancer awareness, but actually promoting the very things which have been proven to increase the chances of getting cancer. This would be like if Philip Morris teamed up with the Lung Cancer Foundation. Barbara Brenner, the executive director of Breast Cancer Action, said, This donation will keep them in business for years. They talk about a cure, but this partnership will create more breast cancer. And Komen knows this. Whatever perspective you choose to side with, the end result is that the initial initiative did raise $4.2 million towards a cure for breast cancer and was indeed the largest lump sum donation by any entity in Komen's history. Because early detection saves lives. Japanese Christmas at KFC. Turkeys in Japan are generally in a chipper mood come Christmas time. That's because they worry much less about being gobble gobble gobbled up in Japan. That's right, instead the turkeys are giggle giggle giggling at their good fortunes as their KFC cousins are the traditional Christmas dinner of choice for millions of Japanese families. Takeshi Okawara, the manager of the first KFC in the country, came up with an idea for a Christmas promotion called Party in a Bucket for his restaurant in 1970. It did so well that in 1974, headquarters decided to to go national with it. Some clever marketing twists later, a new slogan, which literally translates to Kentucky for Christmas, and a new tradition was born. The phrase even sounds catchy in English. Harvard-educated Okawara later climbed the corporate ladder and served as president and CEO of Kentucky Fried Chicken Japan from 1984 to 2002. It's largely due to him that today in Japan, 20% of KFC's annual sales come in December. In fact, that finger-licking good chicken is so popular that you need to pre-order it weeks in advance 
advance, or risk waiting in hours-long lineups to maybe be told there was none left. During that month alone, it is estimated that 3.6 million families treat themselves to KFC, and many franchises boast daily sales that are tenfold their normal take. That's pretty impressive, considering about only 1% of Japan's population is Christian, and Christmas is not even a recognized holiday there. In Japan, the rumors are true they like their Kentucky Fried Chicken. The secret KFC recipe is not so secret anymore. When you're in a secret society, you always make sure to call it the Secret Society. I always assumed the secret recipe was just add a whole bunch of salt. Since no one will absolutely, unequivocally, undisputedly confirm if the leaked recipe is truly the secret, I'm sticking to my guns on this one. But if you're a stickler for facts, then continue on. In August of 2016, Joe Lettington, Colonel Sanders' nephew, claimed he found a scrapbook belonging to his late aunt Claudia, the colonel's second wife. More on her later. Jotted on its yellowed pages were what appeared to be the secret 11 herb and spices, which made up one of the most heavily guarded secrets in the culinary industry. Protect the book! the original Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe. When the Chicago Tribune got hold of it, they decided to go all out and put it to the test. Actually, several experiments were conducted, as it would seem that to nail the recipe, every little detail from batter mixture, flour content, cooking times, and oil temperature all affected the overall flavor of the chicken. And none of these variables were anywhere to be found on the withered pages of the scrapbook. It became a major event, as their in-house recipe tester, Lisa Schumacher, made several batches in the Tribune test kitchen. They invited a handful of food critics and food and dining editors and reporters to compare the batches to the original. After several failed attempts, a final batch was dipped in a buttermilk batter and coated only once, cooked at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Many in the room agreed this batch was in fact better than the Colonel's. A reporter in the room noticed a container of the MSG food enhancer Accent. He decided to sprinkle some directly on the fried chicken, and lo and behold, all the tasters agreed that that did the trick. The final batch was indistinguishable from the original recipe. Only one problem, though. Accent was not part of the secret blend, and a spokesperson for KFC confirmed this. But, you know, I think he's the first original celebrity chef. Reba McIntyre is the first female Colonel Sanders. This next song is all about my $20 fill-up. Marketing ploy or a simple salute to girl power? A bit of both? Here's the thing. Fast food chains are constantly adapting to the market. They have teams of researchers tab up key analytics to see who is eating their food, and more importantly, who's not. So when the numbers guys hand over their data to a fast food chain's marketing division, which show the numbers are dropping because people are eating healthier, the company will do things like add salads or grilled chicken to their menu. If the data shows that younger consumers are eating elsewhere because competitors offer Wi-Fi, well, guess what? Wi-Fi it is. Point being, marketing can campaigns aim to tap those weaker market segments. And although I am not holding KFC's marketing analytics, I can tell you that they undoubtedly had some of the information I found. Studies such as the one conducted by Grubhub showed that men tend to eat more of the unhealthier food choices, while women tended to lean towards healthier ones. Here's the kicker, though. An in-depth examination of pickup and delivery orders from Grubhub's network of more than 30,000 restaurants in over 700 U.S. cities revealed that women are 30% more likely to order food from work than men. Moreover, women spend on average 3% more than men on those orders. That data must have driven the suits at KFC a tad nuts. They added healthier food, yet women still weren't flocking over. Enter Reba McIntyre. Her role, appearing in several commercials as the Colonel himself and becoming the spokesperson for the brand, was hailed to be one of the best things KFC has done since, well, since fried chicken. One of America's most beloved country singing celebrities and with a huge female following, she was the perfect fit. She jumped at the chance, and the ensuing commercials are brilliant, poke fun at the brand, at the colonel, and even at her. Between this ad and their new healthier menu options, the brand finally succeeded in getting the attention of its underdeveloped female market segment. Now, whether this attention will convert itself into dollars remains to be seen. All right, stop, stop, I can't do this. As a brand ambassador, Colonel Sanders hated his chicken. When it comes to the chicken of America, I prefer the white meat to the dark. Harland Sanders sold his chain in 1964 for $2 million, nearly $16 million today, to a group of investors led by John Y. Brown Jr. and Jack C. Macy. He retained control of his Canadian operations and later even moved to Mississauga, Ontario to oversee the Canadian division. While in the U.S., however, he became a salaried brand ambassador for the franchise giant. One problem, though. As an ambassador, you need to be behind the product, and that's very hard to do when you're quoted saying, this is the worst fried chicken I've ever seen 
scene. He was also not so fond of the group's gravy, calling it nothing more than wallpaper paste. Sanders felt the quality had decreased significantly, and even accused the new ownership of using inferior quality ingredients. I refuse to let you take away KFC's Nashville hot chicken. Colonel Sanders cheated on his first wife. I know, dear. <gasps> Remember Claudia Sanders? Sometimes it takes a few tries at love to get things right. She did become the colonel's wife, but not before being his mistress for several years prior to that. Claudia Sanders, nay Price, met Sanders in the 1930s where she worked for him as a waitress in his first restaurant. She was also hired to help his first wife, Josephine King. Ouch. Of their affair, Sanders' daughter from his first marriage, Margaret, later wrote about how her father had a more robust libido than her mother was able to keep up with, so the Colonel started to look elsewhere. Classy. Sanders and Price eventually married in 1949 and remained together until his death in 1980. Together, they built the empire that became Kentucky Fried Chicken. When Sanders sold his shares, the two went on to open up the Claudia Sanders Dinner House in Shelbyville, Kentucky in 1959. It's still in operation today. Oh, because I'm not some expensive celebrity colonel. KFC Gravy. You may want to just use ketchup. It's unbelievable. What do you put in that sauce? You didn't think we'd get this far without talking about some of the odious stuff, did you? The gravy. That wonderfully addictive, saucy goodness served up with every order of KFC fried chicken. Main ingredients? Fried chicken crackle. What's that, you say? Basically, it's the bits of fried leftovers and whatever else that falls into the Winston Collectromatics Collection Zone. This machine basically collects all the chicken scraps, the cartilage, fat, and crusty leftovers, crackle just sounds better, that land in the contraption's bottom tray. A special investigation later uncovered that in many cases, the retrieved morsels were five days old. An undisclosed powder and water are added to the crackle and whisked until thickened, then cooked in a microwave and finally filtered through a very fine sieve to get any leftover crackle out and poured into tubs. Pass the ketchup, please. This health and KFC or double Big Macs? Chicken with fries! Chicken, ch chicken with... <sighs> Now, for those that delight in these wonderful pleasures regularly, or for the rest of us that simply need a decadent cheat day every now and then, get your bibs ready. You're gonna love this. The KFC Double Down Sandwich uses two slabs of deep fried chicken as buns. The buns hold together a generously packed amount of bacon, cheese, and a special sauce. Another secret, I guess. Oh, and KFC makes no qualms about it. This is not for the health conscious eater. This is the stuff burly man dreams are made of. The Double Down Sandwich boasts 30 grams of fat and 540 calories, making eating one of these bad boys the equivalent of eating two and a half Big Macs. It also has nearly three and a half times the sodium as the McDonald's signature sandwich. Ah! Oh my God, I'm a fat guy! The Colonel shot a man over a signage dispute. 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world and would blow your head clean off. The Colonel served briefly in the army as a wagoneer from 1906 to 1907, but he was never a military colonel. His rank of Kentucky Colonel was honorary and one of more than 5,000 titles reserved specifically for the affluent. It was appointed to him by Governor Ruby Lafoon in 1935. So no, the Colonel didn't shoot a man in battle. Sanders was notoriously ill-tempered. As a young man, he lost several jobs due to his fistfights with co-workers as well as insubordination. Oh, and his creative use of vulgarity was well documented among KFC executives. The force and variety of his swearing was even mentioned in a New Yorker magazine article. In 1930, Sanders was involved in a heated and long-running dispute with neighboring shop owner Matt Stewart in North Corbin, Kentucky. Sanders was determined at success and realizing that this was a turning point in his life, he would let nothing stand in his way. The culmination of something that started as a ridiculous, almost boyish schoolyard scrap, each man would systematically paint over the other signs to attract drivers to their respective shops ended in a deadly gun battle. Sanders and Stewart fired on one another, and finally Stewart ended up killing Sanders' manager. Stewart was sentenced to 18 years for murder, but all charges against Sanders were dismissed in court. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, and stay right here. We've got loads more videos for you to check out. All you have to do is click, but you'll have to put that chicken down first.